I think it's, uh, I've had a lot of kind of disparate, unrelated projects, and it's interesting because I think a lot of people in the audience know me for kind of different things a little bit. Um, and this presentation, I think, will kind of pick up on a bunch of the different things people might know that I'm kind of bringing together. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll just uh, dive in. Uh, in 2017, the American Scandinavian Foundation uh, invited me to give a lecture in conjunction with their exhibition, Independent Visions, Helena Schäfbeck and Her Contemporaries. Organized by the Autonomous Art Museum and in celebration of Finland's centennial year of independence, the show was described as, quote, coinciding with a year-long celebration of the centennial anniversary of Finland's independence from Russia, and, quote, provided a rich opportunity for American audiences to engage with these influential Finnish painters. Unquote. By fusing a national discourse of political independence with the sociocultural independence of four distinct women, the exhibition played a key political role in advancing Finland's soft power by espousing gender egalitarianism as a national product. And what I mean by that mostly is that if you follow any of the Nordic embassies in the United States, they're constantly uh, promoting um, ideas of, of gender egalitarianism and especially um, the role of, of women um, in their countries as models for other, especially in the United States, uh, to emulate. Uh, so for my talk, I wanted to really kind of question uh, right, this whole national um, narrative that had, that had framed um, the exhibition. Now, of course, not that uh, the works were national, but because it was connected to um, the Finnish uh, centennial. Uh, and I wanted to put them more in critical uh, dialogue with ideologies of, of race and place and connect them more concretely to um, a more multi-ethnic uh, idea of, of Finland. Uh, but um, I think, right, when we look at, of course, like a glance, these are the four women that were featured in the exhibition. Uh, and this exhibition also became the basis for what went to Miles Gordon in Stockholm and later to Tokyo to the National Museum of Western Art. And then this exhibition here uh, became uh, the foundation for what is now here at Kumu. So it's all sort of weirdly uh, interconnected. Um, but when we look at the glance of the dates that these four women lived, right, of course it reveals how their own freedoms paralleled with, if not intersected and informed, right, the independence of their homeland. Uh, but if 1917, of course, was the anniversary of Finnish independence, it was also important in the Nordic countries for two other very specific reasons. In 1917, uh, in February, also marked the very first Sami assembly, which took place in Trondheim, or Tronte in Sami languages, uh, Norway over the course of three to four days in early February. The assembly had brought together Sami from throughout Norway and Sweden to debate issues of discriminatory legislation, advocate for Sami language schools, and discuss the necessity for non-Sami people to use correct nomenclature. Uh, it was also, of course, a pivotal point in the development of indigenous political activism, and to this day, the 6th of February, is celebrated as National Sa Sami National Day. Um, there was, uh, in 1917, of course, a lot of Finnish centennial celebration, and then another event I'll talk about in a second, but there was very little uh, fanfare outside of, of communities in Sápmi about this Sami centennial. Uh, but less than a month in 1917, after the first Sami political assembly, there was another transformative event in Nordic history when Denmark had sold its possession of the Caribbean islands of St. Thomas, St. John, and St. Croix to the United States, where they became, of course, no longer the Danish West Indies, but the U.S. Virgin Islands. For me, this was important to talk about when I talked about this in New York City, um, because then in 2017, Hurricane Irma had just uh, devastated the Caribbean, uh, and this was also before Maria, the hurricane, uh, another huge, horrible um, hurricane would come. So it was also important for me in the United States context to also um, talk about uh, these people who are technically American citizens, but still remain very marginalized and disenfranchised, both in an American context uh, as well. Um, and throughout Denmark, uh, 2017 had, uh, and this anniversary, right, of this transfer day had sort of catapulted this idea of Scandinavia's colonial past, race relations, and its role in the slave trade into the forefront of public consciousness, if, of course, only briefly, right? And this is just, um, this is just uh, an exhibition uh, that some of my uh, colleagues put together at the, the uh, Royal Library in Copenhagen um, 
And uh, there's also, I mean, there were many, many, many different exhibitions that took place in 2017 uh, that we can talk about later if you want to. Um, but I wanted to acknowledge, right, that Finnish independence shared this centennial year with Sami and Virgin Islanders, right, because these additional anniversaries, right, demand that we understand Nordic cultures globally. They reveal, right, unabashedly, right, explicit Nordic engagement and uh, complicity, right, with imperialism, colonialism, and their racial hierarchies. So when I was in New York, um, I used this uh, exhibition, or the, the talk to uh, focus especially on this painting, uh, entitled Girl from California by Helena Scherfbeck. Uh, it was included in the exhibition. And I found that, um, I mean, I, I was initially kind of just aesthetically drawn to it, right? And it, I think it's very typical of what we think of uh, Scherfbeck's later, right, modernist kind of uh, painting style, and that it manifests, of course, a lot of that, that um, really distinctive uh, way that makes her, I think, um, so beloved, um, just in terms of being a constantly innovative, right, and, and, and uh, inventive artist. Um, but when I did a little bit of research, I was surprised um, that uh, researchers, I mean, of course, Helena Scherfbeck is very much researched and very well known. Um, but uh, when I started researching, I found uh, researchers would quote an exhibition context letters like this one I will quote to you now, uh, where uh, Sheriff Beck had described her model, who's Ulla, her, her cousin, uh, that she isn't always good, she needs warmth and heat to bring out her glowing Indian colors, her copper colors. She is a Creole born in San Francisco. Uh, a later part of the letter, uh, she, or a, a different letter, she talks about the process of painting this image, right? And she talks about, really, she's struggling with finding the right tone. And so what she's really thinking about, right? She later talks about this dangerous side, right? She's literally thinking about the surface color of her paintings, right? The actual color she uses to think about copper tones or Indian colors, right? And, and very uh, distinctively, right, racialized ways of, of making, um, Portraits, And so what I wanted to do when I did in this talk was I sort of situated this kind of thinking, right? Because we think especially often with Sheriff Beck about um, the portrait uh, revealing, right, interior kind of ideas. Uh, but here I think it was important to draw the very deliberately or exterior racial, right, characteristics that are also informing, right, how and, and what she's doing. Um, so I had already been doing this kind of work um, and so when Kumu uh, had approached me uh, to join a kind of investigative curatorial team to kind of start thinking about what an exhibition would be and expand upon this initial Finnish exhibition, which of course, I mean, I had no role in the Finnish exhibition. Um, I uh, was, of course, very excited uh, because um, I'm also very deeply involved also in Baltic art. Uh, and I, it was also clear that, of course, that Kumu's retooling of the show would be a really ideal venue to weave in these ideas of race, of exoticism, of colonialism into this critical focus that we already had on, on gender. And of course, in the Baltic states, there is no similar regional discourse of gender egalitarianism as a brand to disseminate internationally in the way that we see in Scandinavia. Uh, and of course, if we, as we have seen kind of for the past few days, um, or yesterday, I guess, uh, there's a, a very clear difference in uh, the stages of where feminist or gender aware, gender critical art history is in the different regions, right? They're, they're clearly not equal, right? Um, and, uh, and so I think that, and, and also within the Nordic countries, of course, even thinking about colonial questions is still, uh, still new, even though the colonial ties, especially like the Denmark-Greenland relationship or these kinds of things, or the, the Sami-Norway or Sami-Sweden relationship are very clearly colonial. Those are still new. Um, but here in the, in the Baltic states, uh, colonialism has also only sort of recently um, come to the fore, and this is mainly due to, um, in the art historical context, um, a lot of really important work that Linda Kalyundi and Tina Malkrema have been doing, um, especially thinking about, uh, talking about history and how history takes an image or you know, assumes a kind of pictorial form. Uh, and they've done this in various exhibitions, um, one of them beginning in 2013. And then on the centennial of Estonian independence, there was a, a really uh, fabulous exhibition about history imaging where they, where they worked mostly from uh, the 19th century through the Soviet era to question and really bring this kind of um, colonial lens to, to create kind of uh, 
transnational perspectives uh, and kind of escape this kind of national narrative that, that often happens. And also, I hope that some of you had um, seen uh, the exhibition that Linda Kalindi had uh, co-curated with Kadiboli and Neha Komisarov um, that was here, that just closed uh, just a little over a month ago called The Conqueror's Eye, um, that featured uh, this video work by uh, the Maori artist uh, Lisa Rehana uh, in one section of the exhibition and then I think in four or five uh, small rooms there were focused case studies uh, talking about the circulation of racial and colonial images both from abroad, other parts of, um, of European and especially Russian right, imperial um, travelers that also then uh, honed in on how images such as on the right uh, by Karl Timelion von Neff that are very canonical in Estonia um, suddenly seemed a very different kind of racialized, exoticizing um, image that had not always been um, emphasized necessarily in the past. Um, so what I kind of want to do in this last, you know, this little half of my paper is kind of chart out possibilities of, right, if people are thinking about colonialism and these ideas of race or have been popping up, right, how can we use that to kind of help to be conscious and aware of that and reevaluating, right, the cultural production of, of, um, of women artists and, and what they're doing. Uh, so I wanted to, to kind of start the show for, for how I've been thinking about this and where I think it could it could uh, go. And it, it uh, most recently began um, with uh, this sculpture. Uh, this is a small sculpture entitled Black Man with Bananas by Christina May, whom we heard about a little bit yesterday, uh, a glazed uh, ceramic work from 1925. Uh, a bald and naked black man hunches over a large bundle of bright yellow bananas. Of course, it is obvious that uh, we can classify this object as satirical, at the very least, and a clear example of racial caricature. And of course, uh, this kind of caricature circulated mostly right, um, in illustrations and in print. Uh, and what's so interesting about this is that it is, of course, an image that is sculpted, right? It is a physical encounter. Um, in literally shaping a body, right, and in delineating, right, contours in the ways that the limbs are exaggerated in these really long, almost kind of sinuous arms, or especially, most obviously, right, in his face and the way uh, that she's thinking about how to form his nose or his lips. Small and intimate, a black man with bananas is no more than 20 centimeters high. She, uh, in making it, may have lavished a single monochrome, most chocolate brown color on the man's body while devoting more colors to the bundles of bananas, outlining each fruit in a greenish brown color while coloring it, of course, with yellow. Upon closer inspection, we can also see that, well, maybe you can kind of see on the right, uh, that she also delineated uh, the man's toenails, right? Revealing that there's some kind of detail and care, right, when she's making, uh, this kind of sculpture. So I was, was curious about why, right? If, she's, if we can see from the object that she's, she's, she's uh, thinking kind of critically about making this. Uh, Elizabeth Hutchinson, who is a, a historian of Native American art at Columbia University, um, has argued for the erotic potentiality right, within the process of image making between white women artists and their non-white male subjects. And in describing Gertrude Kizabir's photographs of young, attractive Native American men, she argues that, quote, the dusky intimacy of the dark room was not only a potential site for physical bodies to rub up against each other, but also a place where the artist transformed the bodies of her sitters into personal expressions, reflecting her exploration of her sexuality as well as her creativity, unquote. So uh, what I ask in um, my essay in the exhibition catalog here um, is it what might happen if we approach uh, Christina May's sculpture in the same way, right? In this instance, right, we see this intimate object, small enough it could be held, it could be felt, even caressed, and we could also in this way understand, right, the tactile creation of ceramics, of sculpting and sizing a body, as well as the glazing process, right, as a kind of exploratory act Right, where May is navigating right, dismay and desire, right? that creating something that fits into uh, right, like white-centered ideas of black men as hypersexual and deviant. Right? And we have, of course, this banana that might uh, both right, 
add to this, this joke, right, and these Simeon um, connections, right, but also downplaying his nudity and sexual eagerness and attractiveness. Uh, and so, right, I think there is a way that, right, these bananas are presumed to be elements of racist caricature, and so including them helps create images that might manifest internal desire, right? In other words, I, I'm trying to kind of get to this idea that it is racist and it is satirical, but it could also, for its maker, be secretly beguiling and attractive. And I think it is a good example of this conflict that many white European women are facing in the interwar period, right, of conflating, right, this exotic and the erotic together. But this kind of reading is also dependent on the assumption of uh, May's attraction towards men. Uh, the case becomes much more convoluted when we find these kinds of examples when we know that artists uh, were queer. Uh, and a good example here, I think, is a, a series of prints by Tule Kipiatela and the connection of uh, Ateneum. And here, um, these uh, prints, uh, they're very strange. Uh, these, they almost have this kind of like sculptural, like um, sort of form. Uh, I don't know why this, this spacing of these texts is so, I'm sorry that the, the spacing is weird. Um, but uh, I, uh, I didn't know how to translate this, so I called it Black Namibians because uh, this uh, ombo comes from the word ovambo, which was, the, um, uh, was a historical 20th century name for the area of present-day Namibia where the Finnish missionary society had a very large um, an important presence. Um, and so I think uh, there are uh, ways in which images like this, at least uh, Ateneum also, I think uh, Anna Maria Penanen just talked about the Ateneum changing their um, museum or their collection website. And there used to be information, like clear information about the exhibition provenance. And the last time I checked it, maybe two years ago, it said that Pietela's uh, print uh, has never been shown and it's only been sitting in right, in the collection. And, and, and this makes sense, right, because it clearly is connected to this kind of racial caricature. And so, right, talking about how you display these images, why you display them, right, how do you contextualize this kind of information when they do not fit into ideas or they might tarnish, right, um, our ideas of the reputation of a certain artist, that we want to take a single figure and elevate them or we want to, to promote them, right? I think there are ways in which um, we should also sort of reconsider um, more critically, what obviously we aren't including. Um, now, I just have a couple of examples that many of the artists we talked about face this kind of issue with uh, Astrid Holm, for example, this is a, a well-known example that's become uh, especially famous in Denmark. Uh, that is uh, circulating that Holm had created um, in the Virgin Islands. Um, you can talk to Inge Lisa more about this. She's uh, an expert and has written a lot about this. Um, and also, uh, this is actually, a, this is not the full image, this is a cropped image, um, by, by uh, Beethoven, whom we heard a lot about yesterday. This is, this is, I think, actually, I would argue this is probably her most famous painting. This is the most well-known, it's like an icon of Latvian modernism. But until I had written about it um, in 2017, no one had ever talked about uh, how race is functioning, despite the, the fact that the, the painting is literally titled Black and White. Um, and often, right, this, the young woman sitting in the foreground who was a, uh, um, is of Thai background and was taken um, from Thailand because um, the woman in the background was uh, married uh, to an Italian diplomat who worked in Thailand. Um, there was very little kind of discussion about how race and, and class um, manifest here. And of course, also, uh, one of my, famous, my favorite examples is uh, by Tira Klien, who we heard about briefly yesterday, who was elevated in... Um, in the Valdemar Schude exhibition about symbolism and decadence. Uh, also, uh, I traveled widely in Indonesia, also in Southeast Asia, and created a book, or illustrated one, that is uh, in Swedish uh, called uh, A Story About Black Children Told and Drawn for White Children, right? So uh, I bring this example just to also highlight that it doesn't take very much digging to find this kind of material and bring it up, and that the, a lot of times these things are very obvious. When you look at what these illustrations are, right, um, and you see the kind of violence that is inherent within them, right, they also, I think, posit an important way that we should be thinking about the way that white women are thinking about their place in the world, and also uh, it makes us think of uh, Klan's uh, drawing or her portrait of herself um, called the scream in a different way. Uh, 
Also, I think this has really important implications also for the Baltic diaspora and talking about diaspora artists because um, one thing we don't really think about about the Baltic diaspora uh, after the Second World War is that um, in every place where the Baltic diaspora is moving, whether Australia, South Africa, anywhere in Latin America or the Canada, um, they all become very clearly uh, white immigrants. And this is important because they, they, they move into new, very clearly uh, multi-ethnic racialized situations. Um, and most recently uh, in New York City, uh, there was a collaboration between the Latvian Center for Contemporary Art and the James Gallery uh, in the middle of Manhattan that uh, this exhibition, Portable Landscapes, Memories and Imaginaries of Refugee Modernism. And one of the, I think, most striking works is Dinah Dagnia's painting, uh, Vietnamese Refugees, uh, from 77, and it's kind of predicated on this fact that Dagnia likened the situation of being a, a Latvian person displaced during the war to, to Vietnamese people who were displaced during the Vietnamese war, and she has this sort of famous quote that she says, yes, the young girl in the yellow dress on the cart could have been me, right? But of course, uh, the, the experiences of a young, white girl from Latvia moving to the United States would never, her experience as an immigrant would, are never um, exactly the same as it would have been for a Vietnamese girl, right? Coming in and how they're, they're thinking about race. So how we should sort of talk about these things is, is I think both to reframe and kind of counter both women and artists. So one I think is, is to dig these things out and show them and talk about them, um, right? But uh, and talk about images like uh, Emilia de Montjuic, who is famous for her ethnography with Sami people, um, but also to uh, right. And we think about white women, and not just women artists, but also white women artists. But also questioning artists, right? And that we embrace this visual culture turn, and realize that of course there might not be Sami women artists in the same way in the way that if we're not considering like Doji and other kind of Sami visual traditions. But we can so consider, for instance, as Alala Reinberry, who is the most uh, important and visible um, figure in Sami political activism, right, through her own self-fashioning, right, and, and circulating self-portraiture, right, as a visual maker in her own self. And that we should also kind of embrace and, and expand our idea of artists to not only be painters and drawers in this traditional sense, but also, right, the ways in which people are also um, galvanized in, in other ways. And of course, this also allows us to think about different kinds of people that existed. And so I just uh, wanted to end in the way I ended in New York, which was drawing attention to Rosa Emilia Clay, who was the first um, African to uh, receive uh, Finnish citizenship, and she just came from present-day Namibia. And so I just leave you uh, with this image, because I think it says more than what I could say. So thank you. <laughs>